never an indiv indi individualized system. It was always a community effort. What kind of education was, um, so we had a group of people at that time called the reformers. And it was a really um, interesting group. They were either church ladies or some teachers, um, but mainly they were they 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 were for the Indian cause. They wanted to bring civilization, and yeah, it was always uh, Christian women. Um, they wanted to make sure that natives were. They saw the, uh, the really harsh treatment that Indians were receiving. So they, you know, they felt the need that maybe we can help these, these savages. <clears throat> what kind of education? The education to acculturate. They focused on individualism rather than community and Christianity to save the soul. And then citizenship, citizenship training. Um, it's kind of ironic, ironic that um, Indians had to have citizens, had to work for it um, when we had already been here forever. And then all these changes were taking place. And then another change was to aim to become a citizen of the United States. In 1877, Congress built schools for Indians. Um, the reformers and Congress thought, well, this will be uh, not such a, a bloody war as all the Indian wars had developed, but this is going to be a gentler war, one that's ideological and psycholo psychological, and it's going to be against Indian children. And so, therefore, the reformers thought the creation of a Christian army to do this, we're going to be uh, teachers within the Department of Interior. So this was the beginning of um, boarding schools, uh, off-reservation schools. They thought that Congress and the reformers thought if we can take a child away from their family, you're able to take away the savage ways, you know, they, they won't be able to speak their language. Um, it's better to train a child than a, an adult. That was um, the big message they wanted to put out. Um, they thought they tried to educate adults. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard of Geronimo. When Geronimo was imprisoned in Leavenworth, Texas, I mean, not Texas, Kansas, another, the, the men that were with him were sent to Florida and they were in the Panhandle area and it was an old, um, like an army depot and that's where uh, Pratt, General Pratt, he thought, well, why don't I teach them how to acculturate? He put them in uniforms. They would work the land. They would. Um, they were learning the English language, and he saw that they were progressing. They were doing okay, and these were prisoners of war at the time. And um, so he took his idea to Congress, and he told them, "You know what? There's a way to change these people." You gotta, you gotta educate them, and you gotta be very strict with them, and make sure they have a schedule. And so it was, it was a real interesting time because um, Congress and the reformers thought, oh yeah, that sounds really good. So Pratt was the first one to come up with the idea to open the Carlisle Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and that was. Um, the, it was a really far place for, I know that there were people from Laguna, Laguna Pueblo, whose um, ancestors were sent off to boarding school to in Carlisle. So there were Navajo people who were also sent from New Mexico 
and then Apaches. 1880, Chimawa, Oregon to serve the West Coast. Um, 1884, Albuquerque, Albuquerque Indian School. So if you drive down and you see, you always see Indian School Road, right? It leads in down into um, 12th Street. So 12th Street and Indian School, 12th Street, Manal, the interstate, that used to be the former campus of the Albuquerque Indian School, which is now housing the Native American Community Academy. There's the one building left, but in front you'll, you'll see the Indian Health Service offices, um, Indian Affairs, and then you'll see the Starbucks and then Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. So at that time, 1884, probably 20 years later is when my grandmother went to school there. Um, it, was a, it was a big Indian school campus. They even had um, a dairy, a farm, which, which went westward towards, um, I don't know if some of you are familiar with the SIPI, Southwest Indian Polytechnic Institute off of Coors and Paseo. So they had, that's why SIPI is there today. That's where the dairy and the farm was. That's a pretty long distance from 12th Street. So imagine, <clears throat> imagine my grandmother um, working the fields and maybe going to the dairy. And, you know, there were no cars around then. Um, maybe just one or two, but I doubt the Indian school had it. So. Most of the time, um, the students were the laborers uh, on, in Indian schools. They were cooking their own food, growing their own food, and, you know, just, they, it was called a school, but most of the time they were being trained to become uh, maids, servants, nannies. Um, my grandmother, Margaret, she was a laundress. That's what she did at the Harvey Hotel, she said, before she got called back to Zuni. And when she lived in Zuni, she was one of the only fluent English speakers at the time. So she worked for the local um, trader there and she was the nanny to their kids. St. Catherine's Indian School was a parochial school um, at the Santa Fe, also with the Santa Fe Indian School. So St. Catharines is north of Santa Fe, uh, north on Paseo de Peralta, and, um, it's a, and you'll see the uh, cemetery. You'll see a really big church. That campus is no longer in, in use. Um, I think they're trying to have the, uh, there's a big real estate thing trying to happen, but I don't know who's in charge of it anymore but they stopped, um, they had their last graduating class in 1996. And then Albuquerque Indian School faded out in the late 70s, like 1978. Other type of schools for Indian children, parochial or mission schools, um, such as St. Catharines, the Presbyterian Church, which was based out of Albuquerque. They're the first ones that, um, sent missionaries out to Zuni Pueblo. Then later came the Christian Reformed Church out of Michigan. They also came to Zuni Pueblo um, and they, they actually uh, established a mission school there where my other grandmother was a, was a student there. And I went to school there at the mission school in Zuni and then later, they developed a campus right outside Gallup. Um, it's called Rehoboth, New Mexico. And they also, that school was built to Christianize um, the Zuni and the Hopi and the Navajos. And then the industrial schools are like Carlisle, Chamawa, Albuquerque, Santa Fe Indian School. And then on reservation schools were, um, the Bureau of Interior controlled. Um, that was, and I used the example as Black Rock. Black Rock is, in, is just um, up the hill from Zuni, 
So there was a uh, Indian school there. It was a day school, they called them. But that phased out in Zuni. You'll still find day schools in the Pueblo of Tezuki. Um, these are now called BIE control schools, Bureau of Indian Education schools. So there's Tezuki has one. Uh, Santa Clara is now a tribally controlled schools. And then we move into the public schools. <clears throat> which is another type, um, the push to have Indian children go to public schools began around 1928. Um, and this was, this was an interesting time because um, there was always a push for, well, to educate the students, to keep them away from um, tribal communities. And it was so that they will acculturate, but this one was different. They weren't just around um, other natives. Indians were beginning to interact with non-Indians, um, whether it be Hispanic, uh, white, black. Um, in 1881, 1891, US government contract for public schools dated was 1891 public schools were valuable because they're ten dollars a student and a lot of the public schools which were you know the school districts they were they would get money and they still do to this day um they will get money for each indian child enrolled public schools versus federal schools by 1970 Enrollment of Indian students surpassed federal school enrollments by 65%. Um, so that means more natives were going to public schools than they were in, going to federal schools. And federal schools meaning like boarding schools, day schools. And that's still going on today. Um, you won't, you'll sometimes find a an Indian child who has gone to maybe a, a reservation school, a BIE school, and then maybe the family moves to Albuquerque and they're going to public school for the first time. So that whole school system is, the switching of schools is still occurring. So <clears throat> the Johnson O'Malley Act of 1934 continues to be reauthorized by Congress. Um, states such as Arizona and New Mexico with a big Indian population could contract with the Department of Interior to provide funds for public schools, for education, medical, agriculture, social welfare for Indian children. When this was to control uh, mis misappropriation, misspending that occurred prior to um, public schools and um, when sometimes when um, students were going to school at a boarding school, they weren't having good things to eat. Um, the diets were poor and and I'm not going to go deep into the, the what happened at um, boarding school. But there was a lot of misspending of money, you know, um, commission, Indian commissioners were getting rich off of Indian kids. So it, it was a pretty interesting and sad time. Um, I'll, I'll tell you how sad it was for, I have a, a fourth grade daughter <clears throat> for Halloween. Um, she came up dressed really nice, like she was wearing a cardigan sweater with a white shirt underneath and a collar, and she had her hair back. And, and I said, oh, are you the girl from the Adams family? <laughs> and, and she told me no. And I said, well, who are you? And she goes, well, I'm a native kid going to boarding school. It sounds scary enough. So, you know, that just to tell you that's something that um, 
I thought it was hilarious, but it is true. There were a lot of um, things that happened to Indian kids that that were hurtful for generations to come. So we're in an era now of Indian organization and leadership. The push to have Indian control of schools, um, reconciliation, apologies, apologies that took place from the Department of Interior about what happened in boarding school and the development of tribally controlled schools. Um, Isleta Pueblo has a tribally con controlled school. So does um, Santa Clara. And then you also have uh, charter schools popping up like the Native American Community Academy just down the road. Um, so those kind of things are taking place and that's been taking place for um, for quite some time. Um, this was uh, post self-determination era, era 1970 forward. And uh, Richard Nixon happened to be the gentleman um, who signed that into into law 1974, I believe it was when he did the Self-Determination Act, which allowed tribes to, you know, come back and take over your education, your everything, everything, the organization of a tribe. So moving forward, education has gotten better, but, um, you know, there are certain things that are still questionable. So the Johnson O'Malley Act, these funds were administered by the, the US Bureau of Indian Affairs through contracts with public schools, such as uh, Albuquerque Public Schools. And the schools have to submit an application with the Indian Education Plan, utilize an Indian Education Committee to administer the funds, and certify el eligible student count. So that, that's still going on today. Final thought, why, why it matters. I, Indian education will always be unique historically and each Indian student carries their own tribal history and educational story. And um, I don't know if some of you have Native students um, in your classes, um, just think about them for a moment and think about how each student carries their own story. And I always use story because um, for Native people, we come from an oral, oral background. And um, it's been a privilege to carry the stories that I've heard. And I also want to open up for questions if you should have any. But Ella kwa don ya don kokshi suna can up to. Anybody have questions? I do have a question. Um, what what are your thoughts about asking students how they want to be identified? Um, only because you know we're not. I'm not sure exactly how to identify my students, and I ask them, "How do you want me to identify you?" What are your thoughts about that? Well, um, for example, because I teach Zuni students, I encourage them to embrace who they are as native students, as Zuni students. And sometimes they're not all Zuni. They're half Hispanic, they're half Navajo, they're, you know, there's a whole mix now. And I always encourage them, if your mothers are Zuni, um, in Zuni we have a matriarchal system. So you're always going to carry your, your kinship, your clans and when I teach my students to introduce themselves in, in Zuni, I want them to feel good about it. So I practice with them. I teach them how to do that. And then they, you get some students who are um, self-identifying. They'll say, yeah, I am, 
you know, I'm Pueblo, maybe I'm this tribe and this tribe. But sometimes you get some who whose families don't teach that. So it's it's really about maybe, so when I get those students, I, I contact families and say, you know what, I need to know because I'm, I'm teaching them how to introduce themselves. So when you teach them about empower, I like to empower my students, like at the beginning of the school year, I like to make them feel good about being shiwi. Shiwi means Zuni. And I also want them to know that there's a bigger system outside their family structure. There's the kinship system, and then there's the, the Zuni world outside that. And then, of course, the outer world. And so I think if you can find out, you know, maybe just ask them, oh, what it says you're this tribe, you know, and if you guys ever um, are wondering, you know, yeah, yeah, you know that they say, yeah, I'm, you know, native or whatever. There's a database that AP ha APS has which Indian education actually utilizes. And it, 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 you can check it and see what tribes they're enrolled in. So that's another way you can. Okay. Thank you, Mila. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot. I mean, I, I was thinking, what, well, what did I get myself into when I was signing up for this? But the reason why I feel that it's important for educators to know, especially within the school system, is sometimes you don't know that. Nobody teaches that as a requirement for teachers. And more and more, our Native nations are getting bigger, so you're going to, of course, encounter a Native child. And everybody has their own unique history behind them. And maybe parents have always, I find that um, Zuni parents here in the city, some of them grow up here in the city and they're relearning their history later. So it's better to teach that early on. And I think that's where I come in and, and hope to, you know, bring that connectedness back. It's important because when, when Native people who don't go through that process, maybe are born and raised in the city. And then the parents one day say, oh, we're going to the reservation. That's a shock to them too. It, it can be opposite. They're gonna feel weird and, and left out. And I don't want that for any native child. They should always know where their roots are. I don't want I don't want them becoming adults looking for their roots and saying, I wonder if I need to take the, the genealogical test or the blood test. I, I find that always, um, you know, baffling because I grew up Ashiwi, I grew up Zuni, and to hear those things now, I wonder why, do, why don't you just ask your family? Find out who your family is. That's really important because it sets the stage for your, your growth as an adult and going into the next part of your life. And so, and, and the thing about um, boarding schools, that was the first time that pan-Indianism became, the first time intermarriages happened. And sometimes it was intermarriages between the, the, the non-Indian staff that worked there. You know, the railroad, when it came through New Mexico, um, Laguna and Pueblo had an, a contract that with the railroad that they had to um, hire their people. That, that's when um, intermarriages took place with the railroad people and Pueblo women. So it's a real interesting uh, time that the railroad, when it came through boarding school, so that was the first time intermarriages happened between a Pueblo person and a Plains person, between an um, Apache person and, you know, a non-Indian. So, and then even um, Mexican Americans and Pueblo people, Mexican Americans and 
and Pueblo people, those intermarriages took place early on in New Mexico history. So that, that wasn't really new, but that was uh, something that's happened here in New Mexico. Mila, I think Melissa has a question. Okay. Good morning, Mila. I really loved your presentation. I grew up in Bloomfield and 80% um, mm -hmm. of my friends growing up were from the Navajo reservation. Mm -hmm. And so I, as you were talking, um, I was thinking about just my childhood. We are at Volcano Vista doing culturally responsive book studies. Mm -hmm. um, we have not been able to find um, books to do in our book study that reflect the Native American perspective. And mm -hmm. I'm curious if you have some suggestions for some books that present the Native American education perspective that I can take back. Um, are you looking for um, like long ago or are you looking now? Because I'm familiar with, um, so when, when students were uh, in boarding school, they had a, they had a publishing system. They would do newsletters. They would write newsletters. And some of them were really sad. Some of them were really funny. Um, and it was, a, it, was, it was really neat to read some of these stories. And I have a few books that cover the reservation. I mean, when boarding school, one called Boarding School Blues. This has a lot of story in it um, that were published from, and then there's letters that come from, um, I think it was Haskell. Haskell had a collection of letters. There's, this is what I utilize a lot for, and then the education and American Indian. So um, a lot of these people, have gone through UNM, and okay. I I I can look to see what's current for um if you want to just email me and let me know um, I can also send you because my son has his own collection he he went to the Institute of American Indian Arts so there's a lot of um, different you know stories that are relative now. Um, yeah. so the, it, it, there, a lot of them are also family history. I know Louise Edrich, she, she writes a lot about that. There's a lady named Brenda Child who writes about that. There's a Hopi professor, her name is, uh, I don't remember her first name, but her last name is Loma Waima. She's out of the University of Arizona. Okay. She has her own um, published published stuff. That, um, and then you have I have a really neat story I can send to you guys. But um, there's a gentleman, uh, Dr. Joseph Wina. Um, he used to be a professor at UNM. Uh, he's from Cochiti Pueblo, and he wrote a really really neat. Uh, story that was published in a science journal or something but it was about he he grew up with his grandmother mm -hmm. and um, it's a it's a really it's a beautiful story about how she was his first educator and then how he had to go off to boarding school in Santa Fe and that's it's neat but sometimes I noticed that students now these days they can't relate to long time ago. Right. So it's important to have the other kind of stories. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I will. I will email you so I can get your, your thoughts and feedback and, and yeah. Uh, books. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Any more questions? I appreciate you guys coming in. I was really nervous to, um, I didn't know who my audience would be. And it's Native American History Month. So um, there's a lot of resources as teachers you guys can find online. Um, National Indian Education Association has a lot 
Um, there's also, um, who else is doing? There's the lecture series with the Indian Education Department. So all those things are happening throughout the month of November. And the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center is also having another lecture series. But that is all I have for you today. May you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Mila, on that um, lecture series, is there a bit, I was in a meeting yesterday um, and it was on um, grace and patience. Yes. And there was a bit.ly on it, but I didn't get the bit.ly address for it. Um, and it was that lecture series. Does anybody know <clears throat> that? Melissa, was, yeah. it on, was it on Bernard's uh, yes. slide deck? Yeah, but yeah. I, I can't find anything. Like, I, I don't have access to the slide deck. I know there was a recording. Um, um, I see. I can, okay. Yeah, this is a link that I had found um, through the Indian Education, um, and it has the, are you talking about the lecture series? Yes. Yeah, um, that was the link that I had found actually through the, uh, it was actually, I think, through, I don't know, Tuesday Times or something. Um, okay. But it has the list of the dates. It has the URL on it. It has all the information. Perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm actually really excited because my nephew is a, a principal up in Bloomfield now. He just got a pr principal position up there. And nice. we've all been up there and we've all, all been very, at least in Bloomfield, very immersed in the Navajo culture. Mm -hmm. But um, I think he is looking for resources to support the students. And I want to give him this information um, and, and possible connections because I know that at least up in Bloomfield Aztec, there is a real issue right now with virtual learning and getting yeah. the kids that are on the reservation or, or even the ones that live in town access to technology, to information, to, to education up there. It's a struggle. And um, it's super important family-wise as well as just for me having grown up there. And one of these days I'm going to retire up there, but I still want to keep teaching. Right. I want to make sure that I'm staying on top of it and meeting the Native American students' needs. Right. So if you all ever don't want to teach for Albuquerque Public Schools, um, Zuni Public School District is always hiring. Um, Santa Fe Indian School is another, that's a federal uh, job. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's all, they're always looking for teachers. And if you want a different experience, try it out. You might like it. <laughs> Thank but, you so much. Yes, no problem. Thank you so much, Mila. We appreciate you taking your time to do this and share your knowledge with us as a gift. Sure, no problem. I, I hope that, you know, of all the crazy um, federal policies that you'll remember, you know, just at least one story or, or something that comes to your mind. Um, and I'm always available. You can send a, a message to me uh, on email and, um, and just, just so you know, the Santa Fe Indian School is still in existence. They're actually one of the um, leading um, Indian boarding schools. And if you ever pass by on Surreal's Road in Santa Fe, it's a really nice campus. So they, they're doing really good things there. So that's a, a positive outcome from boarding schools. And I went to boarding school um, in high school, and it wasn't in... Um, uh, Department of Interior BIA school. It was uh, a Christian um, school, which was Rehoboth outside of Gallup. And I had a really positive experience. So it, it really depends on the type of boarding school. And um, I don't know, it just depends. I, I'm not one to, to critique it so much, but I know that there's generations of people who who lost a lot, who lost their languages. And that's real um, sad, but uh, that's, I'm, I come from, I always, when, when I hear 
negative thoughts about boarding schools, I think, you know what, not everyone had that experience because I didn't. And, and then a lot of boarding schools, um, you know, created uh, Indian leaders now. They're, they're, they're prominent leaders. And, and that's another positive that I can point out. So it just really depends. But um, thank you. I appreciate you all coming and um, you guys have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Have a great day.